Do they have any other business partnerships other than the rare earth refinery? For an issue that was the storyline for the second season of House of Cards, one of the most popular shows among Hill staffers. The refinery can't proceed while we're in a trade war. We want you to kill us for good, and we want you to kill it today. You'd think this would be something that we'd be more aware of. The biggest uses of rare earths are for the electronics and auto industries. We want our companies building those products right here in America. But to do that, American manufacturers need to have access to rare earth materials, which China supplies. Give me your phone. Rare earth elements. Whole world runs in this. Neodymium and samarium help the Abrams tank navigate. They make up night vision goggles and radar systems. One U.S. government report found element shortages have already delayed some weapons production. I mean, really, guys? You're going to build an entire military based on a mineral element that's wholly controlled by China? I need a drink. Lost in cable news reports and popular entertainment is the most important fact of the ongoing rare earth crisis. The United States was once a world leader in harnessing rare earth technologies. This leadership was not beaten by Chinese rare earth subsidies, nor lax environmental regulations in China. So how did China come to not just surpass the United States, but to dominate rare earths so completely? This was a question addressed in a 2014 briefing to congressional staffers. The full briefing was 80 minutes long. This 20 minute summary contains all the highlights. If House of Cards moved this fast, it would have wrapped in a single season. So there are no issues here then? We're prepared to offer a 40-year lease on the Meimei Rare Earth Elements Refinery. For appearances? Yes, appearances. Your iPhone that you have in your pocket right now has nine different rare earths in it. Toyota Prius, magnets and the batteries and all the material additives, the lighting, the communication systems, the defense systems and so forth. All of that uses rare earths. And as you might imagine, the world demand for rare earths is just only growing. Even though the United States has a considerable supply of rare earths, we are largely dependent on China for these critical metals. The United States holds about 13% of the world's rare earths reserves. China, on the other hand, holds about 50% of the world's reserves, and China actually accounts for about 95% of all rare earths production. About 91% of American imports actually come from China. Well, the rest of the rare earths are still coming out of China, but they come to us through France, they come to us through Japan. In the end, it's all coming out of China. Now at NCPA, we agree with free trade among nations, and so we really have no problem with depending on foreign nations for different goods and services. But in this instance, there is a problem because China threatens to use their dominance over rare earths as a weapon in, uh, in trade disputes. And they've actually demonstrated this in a dispute that they had several years ago with Japan. Imagine if that were to happen here in the United States. China very soon will use 100% of the rare earths they produce. They will legitimately be able to say, we can't afford to export rare earths anymore. We use them all ourselves. And they'd be absolutely right. China is becoming more and more an internal consumer. So if the 130,000 tons that are produced a year, 100 million of those tons go back into China, they never get into the market. At some point, China is going to keep all of their rare earths, and it's going to be acceptable that they're going to do this. They'll be using all of it. When is that? 2018. 2018? Yeah. Yeah. Why is Apple building the phones in China? Because they can procure the rare earths. Well, China has really, in a very clever way, inherited all the manufacturing. One thing our Congress is really good at is defending IP, right? You guys are proactive there you're going to find out that all of those rules and all those laws that we've created and all the mechanisms for enforcing it are only going to play into China's hand. China's used this monopoly to strip the world of their IP. They don't design anything in China. They make companies come to China via rare earth metals and other industries. Then they say, if you're gonna come here and you're gonna be part of our market, you must turn over your IP. And where China signs a 10-year deal, okay, after that 10 years, they boot that company out and it goes to a Chinese company. The CRS, the GAO, and the Pentagon keep putting out reports going, oh, we're doing great, we're making progress. They reference two mining companies that are mining rare earths and they're taking the really good stuff that matters and they're shipping all that powder to China and China turns it into the magic. Now, do they own the company in China that does that? Yes. So they tell everybody, hey, we're doing everything, but that's not really going to work on that F-35. We've had to get exemptions, and a number of exemptions, so that we can import the rare earth materials to configure this airplane. 
That's very unusual to get these exemptions, and we've got a lot of them. Our defense industry is 100% reliant on China. If they control the metal, the alloys, the magnets, and the bolt-on garnets and components that go onto our military systems, they in fact control procurement. Today we are announcing an indictment against five officers of the Chinese People's Liberation Army for serious cybersecurity breaches against six American victim companies. When pieces of our equipment are manufactured in China, they have access to those specs. If we spend a trillion dollars on the F-35, China spends a million dollars in China to look at the blueprints, they caught up to us really quick. The state-of-the-art defense technology is dependent on someone we're competing with. So we can live without the cell phones, as inconvenient as that would be. You can't live without that. And how did we get here? Uh, the U.S. used to lead the world. We owned all the IP, all the technologies, extraction processes, all the metallurgy. The Chinese government was coveting this company called MagnaQuench, which had the best IP portfolio for rare earths in the world. Deng Xiaoping's direct family members on the down low said to GM, you want to build an auto manufacturing facility in China? Give us MagnaQuench. A government-sponsored process to capture all of that technology. And if we aren't willing to fight to get it back, we're left as an extractive economy with basically commodity sales, which I'll tell you is a pretty skinny business. You take your ore and you crush that, and you dissolve it, and then you use a very, very complicated process. It's probably even more complicated than enriching uranium. That's how hard this is. That's how you get those little powders. But those little powders are pretty useless. You know, you give that powder to Martin Marietta or to Boeing, it's not like they can throw it on an airplane. They can't do anything with it. So they take $4 billion in pixie dust, and they turn it into $7 trillion in high-value, high-growth, high-margin value-added goods. That's 10% of the economy. Even if U.S. rare earths jumps into business tomorrow and starts producing rare earths, all they're going to end up with is those powders. And what are they going to do with them? Their only customer is China. GAO did a report a little while ago that says rebuilding a domestic rare supply chain would take up to 15 years if we really wanted to ramp up. A company comes along and tells you, we're going to be a rare earth mine and we're going to build our own value chain. It can't be done by an individual company. There's no way you can take on a country who's got more human beings dedicated to the production and value adding of rare earths than we had in the Manhattan Project during World War II. They literally have two cities that they call rare earth cities. People involved in this, we love the free market, we think that is the best way to go. But the first thing you have to recognize is that you are not dealing in a free market when you're dealing with China. Realize that the companies that do do rare earths can take losses all day long as long as they're supporting a $7 trillion manufacturing base to the government. The United States needs to respond. We need to respond to some things. We can't just be totally passive and say, free markets will fix this one. They're, the free markets aren't in the room. You need multiple players to have a free market. And we must, in the Western world, step up and participate in this. If you're pulling out rare earths and your deposit has, let's say, 8% rare earths, it may have 14% thorium. Thorium was classified as a nuclear fuel in the early part of the atomic age, as if it would be uranium, plutonium. The liabilities associated with being the proud owner of source material, it is so horrific that no public company I'm aware of will ever take on that risk. In the 80s, the IAEA lowered the threshold for the definition of source material. All of these domestic producers of rare earths who were producing these wonderful rare earths that had the full spectrum, all the heavy stuff, their customers no longer wanted to accept the material because when the customer would take the material and extract out the rare earths they wanted, they had a little pile of thorium. And they didn't want to own that little pile of thorium because nobody knew what to do with it. You know, I mean, it's not the kind of stuff you throw out the back door because people that did that back in the 20s <laughs> are still paying for it. Thorium is a very mild alpha emitter, very easily handled, not dangerous whatsoever, and not water soluble, can't get into the groundwater. This source material rule crushed the domestic supply of rare earths 
thorium is just always with that material. The value chain guys that used to take the powders and make the metals and the alloys and the magnets, well, they slowly faded away, went bankrupt, or were relocated to China. That mining companies today literally try to find deposits that don't have thorium. The problem is when you don't have thorium, you don't have those heavies. And the result of that is they end up with an abundance of material that typically sells <coughs> at or below cost, causing losses. So they have a tendency of putting more lipstick on a pig. We need to thoroughly understand the consumer side, grades, percentages of concentrations. This is the only U.S. mining company mining rare earths today, and anybody else going into the business trying to avoid the thorium liability is going to end up with the same general deposit. So what's the problem with this picture? 83% of your product you're selling at a loss. Here's the stuff that matters for the United States. The problem is they ship all that stuff to China to be processed into metals, magnets, and alloys. What happens to all that material that used to go into the value chain today? It's thrown away. They bury it. Companies literally <coughs> bury it to avoid the liability. How much? <laughs> Plenty. You've got to deal with the thorium problem. But what if, instead of treating thorium as a waste, what if we treated it as a potential energy resource? There's no such thing as highly enriched thorium. When you get thorium out of the mining and refining process, it's ready to use as is. How do you not take a perfectly good fuel source and put it back into the ground? If we've gotten the thorium out of the ground and it's in good form for a fuel source, why not make it a material that we can use? And in fact, there's some exciting research underway to develop electricity reactors using thorium uh, instead of uranium. This is not going to be a waste byproduct anymore. This is not going to be a burden. Now we will take something that has kept us for 30 years from participating in the rare earth industry and turn that into energy. Basically, in the 50s, the light water reactor became the reactor of choice for the Navy. The suppliers of that, General Electric, Westinghouse, said, hey, we've built up this whole supply chain and expertise. Let's make a civilian reactor out of this military reactor. Thorium can be used in solid fuel reactors, the can-do reactor, but by far the best possible use for it would be in a molten salt reactor. The thorium fuel is dissolved in a salt that doesn't become liquid until about four or five hundred degrees. The standard operating temperature for one of these reactors is 600 degrees Celsius, three times that of a light water reactor. Light water reactors really don't make very good heat. 330 degrees isn't very hot at all. You know, they use water as a coolant. They're under tremendous pressure, 3,000 psi. Molten salt reactors can't blow up they aren't under any pressure. You could actually look into it. It'd be water clear. You'd see it swirling around like a hot tub. They can't melt down because they are melted down. The whole point of it is anytime you stop working with the molten salt reactor, it solidifies. We've been well served by pressurized water reactors, but we could do even better. The cost is one fifth. You don't have these huge containment vessels, these huge seven and eight stage turbines to make your electricity. Everything is more compact, everything is safer. And when you burn thorium in a molten salt reactor, you get 99.999% burn up. When you burn uranium in a light water reactor, you get one or maybe three, or if you're the French, you get about 5% burn up. So when you use fuel in a light water reactor, you're leaving 95% of that energy sitting in a parking lot in dry cast storage. Molten salt reactor will use 99.99% of the available energy. Very simple pieces of legislation. You can read them in just a few minutes, really. Create a national rare earth cooperative refinery. Also, an actual physical storage facility. The literal thorium bank, way beyond belts and suspenders needed to actually store the thorium safely. Multiple mining companies, providers of apatite, monazite, basisite, xenotime, would now have a facility to process the full spectrum, especially the heavies, which are what we need most of all, because the first thing that comes out of the process is thorium. When you separate rare earths, the heaviest of them all is thorium. And the thorium bank would accept that right at the beginning of the process. And we would encapsulate it and put it in, uh, pelletize it, put it into stainless steel tanks inside a double-lined concrete building, seismically isolated. That's chilled to minus 40 degrees, so absolutely no uh, off-gassing or anything can come from it. It's very impressive and probably about 100 times more than is really needed. but. 
because it's radioactive and we understand the sensitivities of the public, we want to make sure that nobody can ever say that we didn't go far, far beyond the call of duty to safely store this material. And there's a lot of industrial uses. You can see down there that thorium alloys, the tip of every Trident missile, is made out of thormag. All our jet fighters have thorium magnesium uh, gussets in them. Thorium sits right below cerium, so you know that elements have similar properties in columns. Thorium might be four times more efficient than cerium at cracking petroleum. So now thorium could uh, help the petroleum industry. Medical isotopes, the DOE and the NIH together put out a, a plea to start producing these isotopes. All together you'd lower greenhouse emissions by 65%. That should excite anyone from an industrialist to an environmentalist. So the good news is the DOE is working to develop these molten salt reactors. Uh, the trouble is they're doing it in China. So our DOE scientists are in China working with the Chinese Academy of Sciences and China to their great credit is spending billions of dollars and employing thousands of people and they have just up the entry date for the first commercial molten salt reactor to 2024. It had been 2034. That's what great confidence China has in developing the molten salt technology. And yet, uh, we have this idea, probably a touch misguided, that China will share this with us. And I'm kind of thinking they'll share it with us by selling it to us or renting it to us. One more huge opportunity lost for us. We will become purchasers and renters and not makers and doers. Our bill helps get us where we need to be so we can be competitive in the world again. How much does that bill cost? Uh, the bill doesn't cost anything. The co-op pays for all the uh, admin work. So it's one of the few bills in Congress that doesn't cost any money. And actually the manufacturing jobs it creates between bringing Apple back to America, between bringing LG back to America, it's going to create manufacturing jobs and it's going to expand the tax base and create more tax dollars. These manufacturers are working with the rare earth companies on offtake agreements. So it's it's happening. They just spent twenty seven million dollars just securing a claim in Canada. They're like, oh, it's the resource. It's the resource. It's not the. We've got the resources. The resources are there. Companies like uh, U.S. Rare Earths. What can they do? First, they have the storium problem. They've got a liability that's endless. Even if we get them around that problem, their next problem is now they create this awesome concentrate. Are they going to risk a billion dollars to build the factory to make powders? No. The powders end up going to China. We have to replicate the metallurgical value chain on U.S. soil. We have to. What do you think the carrot or the sugar stick would be for us? Jobs, the urgency of a national security uh, matter, or energy? The very real and very serious national security issue is the one that seems to be the one place where we can still get traction if we were to put this into action. How soon could we expect to satisfy our own demand? GAO reported that organic growth, building a value chain, would take about 15 years. I think that's wildly optimistic. But I think if you could jumpstart it by saying to Toshiba, Hitachi, GE, we can all throw in together, and inside that co-op, we're gonna take the raw materials to those magic powders, to the metals, to the alloys, you can do the oxides very quickly. There's not much to that. Maybe five years <coughs> is doable. John and I had some very, very high level people from the Japanese government come visit us about the equivalent of the head of the Department of Energy. We showed him the legislation and he said, <laughs> with a, 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 a senator's senior staffer in the room, he said, if you do that, Japanese government will invest in both. We know they will. We know that the Korean government will. We know that the EU government will, because they're looking at this as survival, and they have to take action. He said, you know, we're a free country. We can't keep Fujitsu from moving and leaving the country, but we have to. With Japan, they don't have oil to extract. They don't have rare earths to extract. They have nothing but intelligence and manufacturing and, IP. and, and IP. And so they are particularly desperate. When you think about how many people are entering the middle class worldwide, probably round out total, over a billion people are going into the middle class. Those are cell phones, TVs, cameras, and we're going to be left out of it. That's no U.S. manufacturing. Let's try and get in there, expand our own tax base here in the United States. Telling Hitachi they can safely build magnets in the United States on a campus that guarantees them supply that's safe, and they can control the distribution and licensing of it, they'll come here. And that's true for anybody else who's got 
IP that wants to protect it. 